Welcome back. Um, <clears throat> so we saw the last time uh, when we talked um, how we, we hinted at how uh, large disturbances right, um, in, in pressure and density uh, can conceivably result in phenomena that are qualitatively different from uh, what we encounter with small differences. In particular, we hinted at, at the possibility of discontinuities forming and uh, today we will have the occasion to uh, talk a little more about these discontinuities which are called shocks. Okay. But before all that, before all that, before starting to talk about large disturbances, before plunging into large disturbances and shocks and things like that, I thought I would touch a little bit upon uh, one issue that, uh, with regard to small disturbances, with regard to sound compressibility, with, with regard to the uh, relation between compressibility and the Mach number. This is something that you will hear occasionally now and then uh, as you go along in fluid dynamics and I also mentioned this in the passing. Uh, but I, I thought we would take a little bit of a detailed look at this. So, uh, just to emphasize for uh, the next uh, 5 or 10 minutes, uh, we are not yet talking about large disturbances. Uh, we are now examining the relation between compressibility and Mach number. Uh, in particular, to, to understand why it is that subsonic flows are generally regarded to be incompressible, whereas supersonic flows are regarded to be compressible. Actually, the more um, the, the more accurate statement would be the effects of compressibility are crucial to uh, examining uh, super, to, to understanding supersonic flows and uh, conversely um, uh, the converse statement is applicable for subsonic flows. But there are some subtleties here and I thought we would examine these subtleties a little bit before we go forward, right? So what is it? Right. So, we, like we said, uh, we remarked that incompressibility approximation is, is, is generally a good one for, uh, in particular, uh, very subsonic flows. In other words, the more subsonic the flow, the better the incompressibility approximation. Right. We've said this and you'll, you'll, you'll also encounter this statement um, here and there. So, so let's try to understand uh, why and how. Right. For simplicity, let's um, uh, restrict ourselves to uh, steady state situations. Steady state simply means this this uh, statement, right? In other words, the time variations as discerned uh, by an Eulerian observer, an observer who's, who's, who's outside the flow, who's, who's standing in the lab frame and watching the flow go by, for that kind of an observer, there are no time variations, okay? Just for simplicity. So, in the steady state, we know that the mass conservation equation is just this. Why is that? Because in, this, uh, you know, in the Eulerian frame, uh, the mass conservation is simply, right? This is the mass conservation equation. And so, if this, this first part is zero, we are left just with the second part. And so, so this is what I mean here, right? Now, we know, we've repeatedly emphasized this, that the incompressibility condition is this. This is the incompressibility condition. So, what does that translate to here? You, you just apply, um, you know, the product rule for differentiation, right? So, suppose in, in, in one dimension, in one dimension would be something like rho du dx plus u d rho dx. You agree with me? Right? So, this is just the product rule, right? So, uh, never mind the dx's. Right? So, this is the kind of logic which leads to this statement. So, if this is much less than 0 or rather if this is approximately equal to 0, right? And we know that this is almost equal to 0, isn't it? This is essentially this in one dimension. So, if this is 0, in which case this had better be 0, which means that u del rho is much, much smaller than uh, rho del u. You know, words, this is much, much smaller than this. So, this is the main thing. This is the, the, this is the main statement uh, that we need to focus on. And let's keep this in mind. U del rho is much, much smaller than rho del u. This follows from the uh, steady state mass conservation equation. Alternatively, you just, you just divide by rho here. You have del rho by rho equals, uh, is much, much smaller than del u by u. So, this is the other way of stating this, uh, very important uh, condition. And now, 
let us now write the steady state momentum equation. Again, uh, just to remind you, the steady state simply means, this simply means, right, partial d partial t is equal to 0. So, the steady state momentum equation now uh, it can be written as this, the Euler equation, neglect viscosity, right, and using the same logic, uh, you, you, th th this can essentially be written as u del u and uh, this can be written as 1 over rho uh, del p and we relate the del p to del rho using the sound speed, right. So, instead of del p, we can write del rho here, del rho divided by c s squared and using this, you can do a little bit of rearrangement to write del rho over rho is equal to u squared over c s squared del u over u. Now, if you remember what we wrote in the previous thing, we said del rho over rho is much, much smaller than del u over u. That is what we got from uh, the mass conservation equation, right? So, right, that is what we got and compare it with this. If this is to be true while this is also true, there is only one way it can be true, right? The incompressibility condition this, so this and this together imply that strictly speaking, the Mach number squared is much, much less than 1 because that is what this is. This is the Mach number squared, right? Well, if the Mach number squared is much, much less than 1, it also means that the Mach number is also much, much less than 1 and vice versa. So, th this is the basic thing, right? So, in other words, and, and where, did, where did this come from? This came from the fact that um, uh, uh, this was predicated, this comes from I e incompressibility. You remember that, right? In other words, incompressibility implies that the Mach number is much, much less than 1 and vice versa. If the Mach, Mach, Mach number is, is not much, much less than 1, in other words, if, if the flows are somewhat supersonic, then incomp the incompressibility approximation is not so good. So, we now find that the same medium can be compressible. So, see here is the other thing. There is no such thing as incompressible or compressible. It depends. Is a medium largely incompressible or the, is a medium largely compressible? It depends. It depends upon whether the wave speeds are sub or supersonic. Okay. If the wave speeds are subsonic, right, then incompressibility is a good approximation. Whereas, if the wave speed which you are talking about are supersonic, then incompressibility is not such a good approximation. So, this is one of the main things I wanted to emphasize. However, having said this, there is a conundrum, right? You might wonder about this. If, if the flow speed is subsonic, well then, you know, uh, 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 the medium can effectively be thought of as incompressible. Um, but I thought, uh, you know, the air in this room is essentially still. Essentially still, there is no velocity at all. Isn't it? So, you know, the wave speeds are definitely, definitely subsonic, essentially zero. And yet, you are talking and uh, sound waves are reaching me, and I thought sound waves were, the, were, were, were an essential, I mean, no compressibility, no sound waves, right? Sound waves and compressibility go hand in hand, isn't it? So, they are reaching me. So, what gives? What is up? The key here is that the wave speeds are sub or supersonic in the lab frame. As we said earlier, always the perturbations, the small perturbations that arise out of my speech or my clapping my hand or something, uh, these, these small perturbations always travel at the sound speed, exactly the sound speed and they travel at the sound speed with respect to the background flow, if any. So, to the Eulerian observer, okay. Uh, what will happen if there is a background flow, then the sound speed gets added to the background flow, whether it is it's, it's in, in, in the plus x direction or the minus x direction or anything. Okay. And it is that added speed which should be either subsonic or supersonic. So, so the, it's, the speed is with respect to the Eulerian observer. Whereas, when you are in the frame of the flow, small perturbations always travel at the sound speed, exactly the sound speed. There is no question of whether this, the, these small perturbations are subsonic or supersonic. They are exactly sonic. So, this is something to keep in mind. So, this entire statement 
okay, is true for the lab observer. Okay. So, when you hear this statement often that you know subsonic flows essentially incompressible, supersonic flows not so incompressible. Yes, all that is true, but this is to do with the lab observer, not with an not with a Lagrangian observer. Okay. So, and for the Lagrangian observer, sound waves i.e. small amplitude uh, uh, pressure and density disturbances travel at exactly the sound speed. They are sonic, they are neither subsonic nor supersonic, they are bound to be sonic, there is no other way around it. Okay. So, I thought I would uh, re-emphasize the small aspect uh, with regard to uh, the speed at which small disturbances travel. They always travel at the sound speed with respect to the background flow. Okay, so, this is something that you need to keep firmly in mind. Before we go on and start talking about large disturbances where you know um, this whole uh, thing about uh, linearization and everything breaks down and, and, and it is with regard to large, large disturbances uh, that we will examine the interesting phenomenon of shocks. So, we will, we will do that in just a second. Thank you. So, having talked about, uh, ha having um, clarified a little bit about uh, the relationship between uh, Mach number and uh, the sonic or uh, supersonic nature of the background flow. Uh, and rather, the, the relationship between the Mach number uh, which tells you something about the sonic or supersonic nature about the of the background flow, the relationship between that and compressibility or incompressibility. I have talked a little bit about that and all this is about small disturbances of course. Uh, let us now get back to uh, starting to think about what uh, the following question. Uh, what if the disturbances are not small? In other words, what if the waves are not weak? Okay. In other words, um, what if the linearization assumption does not hold? This is what, what, what I mean by this statement. Okay. In other words, i.e. products of quantities with subscript 1, right? say rho 1 and uh, say u 1, right? never mind this, right? rho 1 and say this is a 1. Okay. I beg your pardon for this, cannot be neglected. So, if the waves are not weak, uh, in other words, if the, if the disturbances u1 and uh, rho1, u1 and things like this are, are large, then the products of, of quantities like rho1 and u1 cannot be neglected anymore. Okay. So, instead of the linearized uh, mass and momentum equations, we now have to consider the full equations. right? And for simplicity, let us restrict ourselves to one dimension. Okay. So, you have the uh, mass continuity equation in 1D, right? And this is momentum. Okay, you can verify this. So you have these two, and what we're now going to do is this the, the, the familiar jugglery. So these two equations you add and subtract. Okay, you add them first. That corresponds to the plus sign here and you subtract them and that corresponds to the minus sign here. Okay. And so, you add the equations and you, uh, and, and you get du dt plus 1 over rho C s d, dp dt plus u plus C s and here also the plus sign is to be considered equal 0. And you subtract them and this entire thing with the minus sign here, here and here that is valid. That is what this means. Okay. And I strongly urge you to work it out. Okay. And you realize where we are going with this, we are trying to uh, figure out something uh, like a Riemann invariant. You remember the j plus and j minus that we talked about uh, when we met last. So, but those j pluses and j minuses were for the linearized mass and momentum equations also in 1D. Here, there is no linearization because we are considering uh, a condition where the per perturbations are no longer weak. Okay. So, you have this and this can be cast again I urge you to show this in the following useful form like this, this equation. This entire thing can be written as this where the quantity f is nothing but 
dp over rho cs which is 2 over gamma minus 1. Again I, I, I urge you to carry out the algebra which uh, you know. So, what you can see now is it is it's really this quantity that is at vector along. This is again an advection equation because this is a d over dt of this quantity plus u plus c s d over d x of the same quantity is equal to 0. So, if you consider just the plus signs all along, this means this represents a situation where the quantity u plus f where f is defined by this is propagated unchanged. In other words, it is advected okay, with a velocity u plus c s. Similarly, the minus sign of the equation represents a situation where the quantity u minus f where f is again given by this is advected without change at a velocity u minus c s. That is what this means. Okay. So, we in other words we have a conserved quantity that propagates forward or backward okay, uh, along the characteristics with a speed v plus or v minus c s. So, if you are talking about the forward characteristics it corresponds to v plus c s. If you are talking about the backward characteristic you are talking about a velocity v minus c s. So, you can already see the wave can be either supersonic in other words it can, it can be v plus c s or it can be subsonic v minus c s and v itself can be you know anything literally. And I urge you to examine how this equation is different. This is, this is an advection equation just like the advection equation we wrote down for j plus and j minus uh, and the other two Riemann invariants some time ago. And ur I urge you to compare these two equations and note the difference. What are the similarities and differences? The similarities of course is that both of them are advection equations. Uh, both of them talk about conserved quantities, but the conserved quantities themselves are quite different. Okay, so, I urge you to think about them. Now, what happens here? With the weak waves, what you could have is the forward and the backward characteristics. The forward characteristic which, is, which, which propagates at v plus c s and the backward characteristic which propagates at v minus c s, they, inter, they can intersect to give you a unique solution. So, that can happen here too as with the uh, uh, weak waves that, that we uh, talked about earlier. That can happen now too, right? Okay. But in this case, since you know you, you remember the, 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 this thing that we discussed a little earlier, uh, consider a pressure pulse and the P is here and let us not talk about very, uh, for, for simplicity, let us not, let's not bother about uh, you know density variations. So, let us only bother about pressure variations, variations for the time being and uh, if, the, if the pressure pulse is large, large enough so that the sound speed here is larger than the sound speed here. Hmm. This is the leading edge and this is the peak of the pulse. Okay. But since the sound speed here can be larger than the sound speed here, there is a possibility that this can overtake this. As time goes along, this feature propagates faster than this feature and there is a possibility that this feature can overtake this feature and, and there can be a wave breaking of sorts. Right. So, that is what I mean by this. So, two forward characteristics can intersect not forward and reverse characteristics, two forward characteristics can intersect indicating that the solution and, and this is in some sense you know this is uh, this leads to non unique solutions this thing. Okay? If two forward characteristics can intersect it leads to non unique solutions I, I urge you to think about this. And what that means is that the solution can be double valued, okay, which is to say that there can be, uh, it hints at the presence of, of a discontinuity or a shock. And I would put up an, an article by Lax and this, uh, they give a little more of a general discussion. Uh, so, we, we will do that and I will put that up and I am only giving you sort of the, the essence of that, of that discussion and there is a lot more to be said about, about uh, this very interesting thing, uh, the fact that for the situation where the disturbances are not small, uh, you can have intersecting characteristics, but not forward and backward characteristics intersecting, but two forward characteristics intersecting and that uh, leads to this mathematical problem. 
okay, of non-unique solutions and uh, that essentially leads to uh, the realization that such solutions can c contain discontinuities uh, which we will realize and some of these discontinuities can be what are called shocks. So uh, we will talk a little more about shocks in the next segment and uh, but, but this issue about characteristics is dealt with quite extensively uh, in this article by Lax uh, which I urge you to read. So we will stop here for the time being. Thank you. <laughs>